Good morning, and uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, as the Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, I'm pleased to announce the official release of CBP Southwest Border Migration Statistics for the month of August. And I've said this many times, since Congress has failed and continue to fail to pass meaningful legislation to address the crisis at the border, which would ultimately stop children from being used as passports and end the cartel's ability to exploit this population, as well as our laws, the Trump administration has taken a number of unilateral actions, unprecedented actions, that we're going to discuss today. But first, let's discuss the results of the administration's incredible efforts. During the month of August, CBP apprehended or deemed inadmissible a total of 64,000 individuals. For July, if you recall, that number was just over 82,000, which represents a decline of 22 percent. Moreover, the August numbers reflects, and this is critical, the August numbers reflects a 56 percent reduction from the peak in May, which you recall was over 144,000 individuals. And why? Why do we see in 90 days a, a uh, 56 percent reduction. The president has made it very clear that he's going to use every tool available to him and this administration to address this unprecedented crisis at the southern border. We have seen historic agreements and policies put in place by this administration. Uh, unprecedented network of initiatives uh, from regulatory reforms, policy changes, uh, interior enforcement efforts, the list goes on and on what this administration has done that resulted in this 56 percent decrease. In addition to that, let's talk about the government of Mexico. The government of Mexico has taken meaningful and unprecedented steps to help curb the flow of illegal immigration to our border. And let's talk about a couple of numbers. Mexico has apprehended approximately 134,000 people uh, so far this calendar year. Last year, 2018 calendar year, the entire year of 2018, 83,000. That's a substantial increase of apprehension that the government of Mexico has executed. In addition, since June, Mexico has deployed, deployed thousands of troops. They've created a new National Guard within their country. 10,000 troops to the southern border, 15,000 troops to the northern border uh, with the United States. Again, unprecedented support and cooperation with the government of Mexico. But, but I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to go into a little bit more what the government of Mexico has done, but they need to do more. And I'll talk about that in a second. The international outreach to the governments of Central American countries uh, is also beginning to yield effective and positive results, particularly the efforts to stem the surge of illegal migrants crossing the southwest border and to disrupt alien smuggling organizations. Additionally, the, these, the, the Northern Triangle countries specifically, along with the government of Mexico, have really joined the United States as true partners for the first time. They really are seeing this as a true regional crisis that needs continuing coordination, cooperation, and effort, that this is not just a United States problem, that this is a regional crisis that needs regional support and regional solutions. Third. Again, and this goes to the support that the government of Mexico is providing. The migrant protection protocols, or I'm sure most of you heard MPP, have also helped. Tens of thousands of individuals arrive at our southwest border every month, many of them attempting to enter illegally. Historically, we've talked about this. this these individuals, because of our broken asylum laws, have been released into the interior United States as they wait for their asylum hearings. These proceedings can take years. Uh, a, a host of reasons, a, a shortage of immigration judges, uh, backlogs, the list goes on. Additionally, many never stick to the process and never continue to go through its final s uh, stages. And even when they receive a final order of removal, they still remain in the United States illegally. Those are facts. Under the MPP, aliens who, who are entering or seeking asylum and admission to the United States from Mexico illegally or without proper doc documentation now may be returned to Mexico and required to wait outside the United States 
for the duration of their immigration proceedings, which take place in the United States. The government of Mexico has agreed to provide them while they're waiting in Mexico with appropriate humanitarian protections for the duration of their stay. Here's a couple of key points of MPP. It discourages the abuse and exploitation of U.S. laws and non-meritorious or false asylum claims. MPP also helps promote a safer and more orderly process along the southwest border, freeing up limited resources and helps free up time of those implementing this process to devote to those migrants who may legitimately have a merit-based claim. As of September 1st of this year, CBP has returned more than 42,000 individuals to Mexico under the MPP. Now, let me, let me emphasize a point that I made to a, a minute ago. Even though Mexico has stepped up unprecedented, they have joined the United States as well as our Northern Triangle, Triangle partners and really stepped up as true partners and really are really seeing this as a regional crisis. And they have stepped up in unprecedented ways. We need them to do more. We need Mexico to do more. We need to make sure that they're sustaining the efforts right now, that the National Guard, the 25,000 troops they have deployed, stay on target, stay on task. We need them to continue to join and expand the MPP, which is a game changer right now with respect to STEM and the flow. The Mexico needs to continue to work with our intelligence folks to use information, share intelligence, and develop target enforcement actions and strategic locations in their country. So they are stepping up in unprecedented ways, but we need them to continue to sustain that, and we need them to continue to do more. Lastly, deterrence. President Trump is making it clear that if you come to the United States of America illegally, you will be removed. If you come here as an illegal alien in the United States, you commit crimes or illegal ta illegally take American jobs, you will face consequences. Now, let me talk a minute about the border wall. It's just a little topic that's been in the news. President Trump has made it very clear that we will build a wall on the U.S.-Mexico border. And that, as a CBP commissioner, I can tell you that's exactly what we're doing every single day. Together with the United States Army Corps of Engineers, CBP has constructed more than 65 miles of new border wall. And it's more than a border wall, it's a border wall system. And now that we have the Secretary of Defense Authority to, to use an additional $3.6 billion, we're hoping to build between 450 to 500 new miles of border by the end of 2020. But I want to make sure that, that I emphasize something as, as a CBP, CBP commissioner. The Border Patrol field leadership, they want this wall. This is not a vanity project, as one of the false narratives out there has been, and I've heard it numerous times. This president has delivered to the experts, to the Border Patrol, to the leadership, ask what they needed. One of the key things that they said they needed was the wall. And this is not just a wall that's being built right now. It's a wall system. It includes access roads, lighting, technology. And when asked, the leadership universally has said the wall works. Where it's been used in the past, history has shown the numbers go down. Facts and history show that. And we've been saying for a very long time, the experts have been saying when, was, when they were asked by the president, this wall is absolutely needed to help safeguard and, and secure our southern border. As part of what we've always been saying, a multi-layered approach of infrastructure, technology, and personnel. And where that is implemented in effective strategic location, it works. The experts say it works. The experts have asked for this, and this president and this administration has delivered, and they're going to continue to deliver. And as we stated from the beginning, that wall is an integral part of that multi-layer strategy. In closing, President Trump has used every tool available to address the humanitarian security crisis at this border. The entire DHS family, including USCIS and ICE, are working together with CBP to secure and restore integrity to the immigration system. And I, as the commissioner, could not be more proud of the men and women of the Customs and Border Protection who for they support what they do and their steadfast devotion to their mission and the rule of law 
and doing so with humanity and compassion. And let me summarize by reiterating that we are absolutely encouraged by the downward trend of apprehension numbers, but we know these numbers could always spike upwards. History has shown that. We've seen it happen in the past. We cannot rely solely on the government of Mexico or Central American partners to solve the pull factors created by our broken system. Unless the laws change, these numbers will rise again next year, just as we've seen in the past. We will again face the same kind of crisis we have for way too long. Congress must absolutely act to pass meaningful legislation to address the loopholes in our current system if we're going to have a durable, lasting solution to this crisis. I'll take your questions. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, sir. A couple quick questions. First, can you address the complaints, of reports, and abuse of minors in U.S. custody? And secondly, are we giving up on when this was sold, the wall was sold, we were told that Mexico would pay for the wall? So let me so take your that, first question. Is that gone? So with, with, with allegations of abuse, and we, we've talked about this a, a lot, one of, one of the stints that I did uh, with CBP a few years ago in 2014, I actually was the acting assistant commissioner for then internal affairs, which is now OPR. And I can say from my personal knowledge that every single allegation, every single allegation that is brought forward with any type of abuse or violation of policy is absolutely investigated to its fullest. And it's not just investigated by CBP. There are multiple layers there. So the DHS IG, they have a take at it. If it's appropriate, DOJ Civil Rights Civil Liberties section uh, takes a look at that as well. So I'm confident that I can say every single allegation is taken seriously and investigated thoroughly, and when appropriate, appropriate discipline is utilized. Now, so for the, the, your second question, uh, the, the wall, as far as who paying for it, as the commissioner of CBP, I don't care. That's political. That, that, that's, that's for politicians to decide. What I can tell you as a CBP commissioner, every single mile of wall that is built, this country is more safe. Every single mile of wall that's built, it allows the Border Patrol agents to exponentially increase their capacity to do their job. That's what I can tell you. So. Question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, a federal judge in California has reinstated a ban on the administration's policy that would restrict migrants' ability to apply for asylum at the southern border. What is your reaction to that and a follow-up, please? So my reaction is I'm frustrated. Uh, the, the unprecedented judicial activism that we've experienced every single time that this administration comes up with, a, with what we believe is a legal uh, uh, rule or policy that we really believe that will address this crisis, we end up getting enjoined. Uh, it's very, very frustrating, but we're just going to keep going. We'll, we'll continue to work within the current legal framework to address this. And here's what should be frustrating to the American people. This president and this administration, we keep having to go outside the box within the current legal framework to come up with new initiatives, new policies, new regulations, because this Congress won't do their job. This Congress, I've talked to multiple people on the Hill. I personally told them exactly what they need to do to pass meaningful legislation that would end 85 percent of this crisis. I think you could put it on one piece of paper and do it in a half an hour, and they refuse to do so. That's what really should frustrate the American people. And a quick follow. I want to ask about using resources like personnel and finances related to the United States military. Is that making the sort of difference that you thought it would, and are you sensitive to the pushback? that we've certainly heard from a number of people that by engaging the military in this particular fight is perhaps not the best use of their time and energy. So what I would say is it, it would be way outside my lane to talk about uh, the impacts of the use of the military or the funding. That really should be left up to the Secretary of Defense. Here's what I will say on this, is that I have uh, full confidence, confidence in Secretary of Defense that he would not approve either the utilization of resources or funding that he think would negatively impact his job to carry out his national security mission. But I would, what I will say is, CBP, we're doing a national security mission, too. The crisis at the southwest border is not just a humanitarian crisis. It's also a national security crisis. So again, every, every troop that's assigned there, they are helping with the national security crisis along the southwest border. Every mile of wall is helping as well. Mr. Commissioner, so, ma'am in the back. Uh, hi, Elena Cooper, yes. Um, you talked about needing Congress needing to do more. What's the latest with Jared Kushner's immigration plan? He's been told that he's planning to roll it out into a 
formal bill in a couple of weeks? So I think that's a great question. Again, that shows this administration's effort. As Congress continues to fail to put anything out there, they haven't even brought anything to the floor, any meaningful legislation to the floor. So uh, Mr. Kushner, as well as the team, they are trying to put together a comprehensive plan that, that hopefully get uh, uh, traction. DHS is, is, is working with that. We have people, I personally am, am, am having uh, dialogue and discussions with that. Um, it would be great to be able to put something together that's meaningful that we could get bipartisan, bipartisan support to actually end this crisis. I applaud his efforts. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, um, thank, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, uh, I've been told I can only give people one question. Well, I'll, okay. one, one and a half then, sir. Okay. Uh, the half a question, you, attri you attribute the drop in apprehensions to uh, the president's policies, but isn't it also true that uh, apprehensions always drop this period uh, of the year during the heat? And also, uh, you well, let, let me take that question. So, so I think that's a good question because that's one of the false narratives out there. So the past five years, uh, due to seasonal reasons, we've seen on average that those numbers drop about 8%. So if you look from, you know, uh, um, June to July, we saw those numbers drop by 40%. So, so it, it's just not supported by the facts. And now, generally, from July to August, uh, last year from July to August, an example, the numbers actually went up 16%. This is the season when they start going up. And what I just said, this year, down 23%. Absolutely. It's what this president and this administration is doing. It has nothing to do with seasonal trends. And the second question, uh, you just now complained about uh, judicial activism and, and having uh, policies uh, enjoined by the courts. Uh, isn't it also uh, just as possible that the policies that are being promulgated don't comply with the law? I mean, isn't that the judge's job to decide what's legal and what's not? And the judge's job is interpret law, not make law, and that's what I think judicial activism means. That's a big thing in this country. I believe it's a big problem in this country. We can disagree on legal premises and have that argument. That's what courts are, do, are there for, to interpret the law, not like, make the law, and judicial activist decisions like this, I think they're trying to make law instead of interpret that. So, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we know that the primary drivers of the border crisis are Central American families. How specifically has the administration's policies affected that demographic? So that's great. So at the height in May, remember, we saw about 144,000 just just staggering, catastrophic numbers. Uh, we were ranging between 65 to 70 percent where family units are unaccompanied minors. And remember, because of our broken laws, that meant uh, uh, those 65 to 75 percent, they were being released into the interior United States, never to be heard from again. Right now, as these numbers are not only continuing to drastically decline, you know, 57 percent in 90 days, so has that demographic. Uh, this month, that demographic fell from 65 to 75 uh, per, I mean, 70 percent to 55 percent. Question, if I may. I understand that the administration says that there have been 65 miles of border, new border wall built, but that's in areas where there have been vehicular barriers or smaller, more porous uh, border uh, systems. When can we expect the administration to break ground on border wall where there hasn't previously been any barrier? So I'm really glad you asked that question. So because, again, I think there's a false narrative out there that goes no new wall has been built. I'm here to tell you, as a commissioner of CBP, that's just a lie. Every mile of wall that's being built, it is a new mile of wall. And again, I'll reiterate, it's not just a wall. It's a wall system, integrated lighting, integrated technology, and access roads. If you go to those areas where there was pedestrian barriers or there landing mat where they could just knock it over the car or, or uh, uh, cut, a, cut a hole in it in, in, in seconds, where new wall is going in, that's exactly what it is. And you go out there and you ask the agents, they'll tell you, that's new wall. The second part of the question is, is that I think is a fair way to categorize this, is where are we building new linear miles. So it's not just where there was some physical barrier already there, but new linear miles. So I told you we're, we're anticipating by 2020 about 450 to 500 miles. Right now we have current projects that are slated in a couple areas, including RGV, which will easily reach 100 new miles of linear wall. So, sorry, I already gave you two, so, so yes ma'am. Is the administration considering offering TPS to the people of the Bahamas? 
Yeah, so, so uh, y yes, and, and I think that's a good question right now. And there, there's a little bit of, of confusion out there. Uh, this is uh, off the immigration, the southwest border, but Bahamas. And uh, I think it's clear, CBP is an inter integral part of the DH national response framework. Part of that is, is when people are affected by uh, an area or crisis like this, like the hurricane, is, is how can we get them to the United States if, that, if that's the best decision? Uh, CBP, along with the entire United States government effort to support the government of the Bahamas, is, um, is absolutely first and foremost, uh, uh, you know, life and, and safety of individuals. So we are, we've deployed CBP, I've authorized the deployment of an enormous amount of resources to Southern Florida to make sure that we can effectively receive people that are coming in from the Bahamas. Already we're, we've received two uh, cruise ships, uh, thousands of, of folks that we have processed. Uh, flights are coming in constantly. Uh, we've deployed additional folks out to even the small airports. We're we're reaching out to the aviation uh, uh, companies and corporations to coordinate. We're coordinating with the cruise ships every single day to make sure we can do that effectively in a timely process. But I want to be very clear, though, because because I've already seen some false narrative out there is that doesn't mean that we do this with a blind eye. We still have to balance the humanitarian need and assistance of those that need it versus the safety uh, of this country. So we still will go through the process, but we're expediting that process, putting more resources down there. We're waving the normal fees. I could go on and on with what we're doing to try to expedite the process, but keep in mind, there are still people that are inadmissible to this country. There are still people coming here that could have criminal convictions. We are going to process them and handle them normally to make sure this country is safe. <laughs> You said ma'am. You Mr. say ma'am? Yep, in the back, please. Uh, thank you. Just a quick question about uh, Mexico's role here. Have there been any concessions or pledges by the White House, financial or otherwise, to get them to continue their support? So uh, I think that's a good question. The dialogue continues. Uh, the vice president is, is going to meet with senior officials uh, uh, from the government of Mexico this week uh, to, to have that exact dialogue, to talk through about what has been done, what still needs to be done uh, as we, we, we continue to go. So, so those negotiations are ongoing. Are you going to be part of the meeting? Uh, from Mexico with the BP? If, if I'm asked, I will. So, yes, sir. Every mile of wall makes the country safer. And you said by next, the end of next year, you are expecting 450 to 500 miles of wall. Uh, the Washington Post has reported that uh, the president would like the wall to be painted black, and that by doing that, the extra cost would actually shorten the wall uh, that you're hoping to build by four miles. Have you objected to this to the president? Is the president? Uh, and with this directive making the country less safe? No, so I, I think uh, th there's a, a lot that goes into it, and that's why I always say, uh, I, I give an approximate, like 450 to 500 miles, because there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, the, I, I, I'm on constant uh, communication with, with the, the general, General Seminite that's leading the Army Corps of Engineer efforts, and there's a lot of factors that go in there. The terrain, what they hit when they start digging, you know, the factors go on and on. I think it's common sense. And so there are a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, to include uh, uh, adding anti-climbing uh, um, uh, features to the wall as well. Painting is one of those. Uh, sure, there will be a cost associated with that, and that may impact the number of miles. But again, the operational impact that it will get through painting. You, you support painting the wall? That would I, 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 think, no. I think we need to streak, strike a balance between making sure that the miles we build is the most effective wall system we build uh, with, with respect to also the number of miles. I think it's a, a balance we need to strike, and that's exactly what we're doing. Sorry, yes, ma'am. Sorry, yes. Um, I, can you detail uh, how long in the process of the Bahamian uh, persons who are leaving because of the humanitarian crisis, how long are they allowed to stay? Can you give us a little bit more detail on that, get into the weeds on that? And also, where specifically is this new area of wall, the 65-mile stretch of wall being built? Where specifically is that? So two questions. So so on the the... the, the with respect to the Bohemians coming in, it really is dependent on the level of, of reconstruction and recovery, right? So we, we will make that determination as that goes on. Again, our first and foremost concern. Years, months? Again, it, it depends on how long it takes them to recover and rebuild. Again, our the United States government, including uh, uh, CBP, our first concern is, is the, the safety and well-being of those. So no, we, we would not support returning people where to, to a place where it's not safe for them to be. With respect to the wall, um, again, that's being built in strategic locations along the southwest border, uh, Yuma, uh, California, 
um, RGV, Laredo, I mean, the list goes on. And we're continually to work with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers to make sure that we're striking that balance of, of our strategic uh, needs and locations and where we can get the, the, the most mileage at, out, out of uh, what we have. So, Mr. yes, sir. Commissioner, uh, in July, a, a border official testified before Congress that HIV status is being used to justify family separation at the border, which the CDP, CBP later clarified to say occurs on a case-by-case -case basis. Is that policy still ongoing? Yeah, so what the policy is, is that we're going to look at, first and foremost, the health, safety, and well-being of the child. And we will use a totality of circumstances to make that decision uh, to determine any type of separation. And that, that's a policy. It has been and continues to be. Yes, sir. Mr. Commissioner, specifically on the Bahamas, there was an incident where uh, about 100 uh, people fleeing the Bahamas were gone to a ferry and reportedly were kicked off the ferry because they didn't have the proper documentation. The CBP has gotten a lot of criticism over that because they didn't have these, uh, they were the, allegedly they were supposed to have these visas. Uh, I just want your reaction on that, sir. And I do have a follow-up question on a different topic. So what, what I would say about the Bahamas is that you can imagine any type of natural disaster like this where you have this huge disaster, um, a, a lot of resources go on, uh, going on and, and responding, there's going to be some, some confusion. And so what I will say is that's what it was. So, so CBP, we are not working and telling a cruise line that you can not allow anyone without documents. That's just not being done, okay? So there's just some confusion there. We will accept anyone on humanitarian reasons that needs to come here. We're going to process them expeditedly. Again, though, if they are deemed to be inadmissible, for example, if they have a long criminal history and they've been denied entry in the United States uh, previously, we're not going to allow that person into the, the, the country to roam freely. We're going to process them like we normally would. So, Mr. yes, ma'am. Yes, said that if the Flores Agreement is revoked, that you think that families will be kept between 50 to 60 days, um, and that it won't be indefinite. Those were your words. Why should people trust the Trump administration won't keep kids and families indefinitely, given the, the reports of children being um, held in dangerous conditions? Why should people trust this administration? So, for, first of all, I, I would probably object to the term that they're being held in dangerous con conditions. We, we would need to, to, to do a little bit more deeper dive exactly what you mean in that. But here's two things that I would say. One is history shows that. History shows, again, we've talked about this before, about a non-detained docket, which means those individuals are released into the United States, its backlog takes years, versus a detained docket. History shows that under detained docket, it takes about 40 to 60 days to get through that process. And then if you think of it from a common sense perspective is, why would we want to drag that process out? It's more costly to the taxpayers. It, ties up resources from all the agencies that could be doing more law enforcement action to safeguard this country. It serves nobody purpose uh, to, to make sure to, and drag it out to include the immigrants that are here, both on if you're here and your claim is found to be false or fraudulent, let's, let's determine that quickly and return you to your home country. More importantly is, is if your claim is found to be uh, merit, uh, uh, based on merit, then let's get that process quickly so you can be returned and released into the United States. So, yes, sir. Have you seen any indication that there are talks ongoing for a safe third country agreement with uh, other countries of the U.S. that happened with before? It was already announced for a six month long. Yeah, so I, I think words matter, so I, I want to stay away from, I, I think that's a colloquialism that, that we use in the United States, safe third country. But yes, we, we are uh, reaching across the aisle uh, just as we did with the, the government of Guatemala to come up with a cooperative agreement uh, to uh, return individuals uh, to Guatemala who had who transitioned through other countries. Uh, we are continuing to have those similar discussions for cooperative agreements with uh, other countries as well. And, and think, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're continuing. Um, I, I'm not going to speculate. Uh, we're still negotiating, still a little bit early. Uh, I'll leave that up to maybe the vice president and his discussion uh, th this week. But what I can tell you, think about this from a pragmatic standpoint. If somebody is fleeing their country because they feel that they're, they're being persecuted for, for a list of legitimate reasons, it really is in their best interest to apply for asylum to the first country that they have entered outside of the country that they are being persecuted. That's our design. We believe it's in their best interest as well. Sure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, with the numbers going down, uh, is there a point at which they'd be down far enough 
that the national emergency or crisis at the border will be over. And in a related question, they uh, went up under Kevin McElhaney, uh, who's now the acting DHS secretary. Um, why did he get promoted rather than fired? So l let me take the uh, second one first. That's way out of my lane or my pay grade. So the, the, uh, the, the what, what was the first question again? Uh, when will the numbers go so, down far right. enough that the emergency is over? So, so what, what I would say is that that's tricky. So I've been asked that a, a couple of times. And, you know, trying to just be honest and, and transparent with that from CBP, hey, look, if, if, if I could see daily apps around 500 a, a day, I, you know, that, that's manageable, I, I think. Uh, w would I say that that's the magic number? The magic number is zero, right? But we have to be realistic. But even saying 500, saying a specific number, it's not really that easy because it's not just about the numbers, it's also the demographics. Now, one thing we've agreed upon, and it gets back to your question, ma'am, about dangerous conditions. Here's one thing we agree on. We've always said from day one that children, children, should not be in border patrol facilities that were designed for single adults. We've said that to begin with. So when we're talking about numbers, if the majority of those numbers, even 500, are kids, you know what? I, no, I, I would not say that that's manageable because we still don't have the proper conditions in border patrol, the current hard structures to do that. We're still going to have to maintain soft-sided facilities to provide the conditions uh, that we are providing now, which is what we should be. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Richard. I want to clear up, or at least from my understanding, clarify something that you said to one of my colleagues here who asked about TPS status being granted to Bahamians. You said yes. Can you, are we specifically talking about all Bahamians who've been affected by Dorian who will be granted TPS status, or are you talking about simply expedited entry to the U.S. for those who qualify? Uh, right now, we're working through that, and thanks for following up. So we, there hasn't been any formal grant of, of TPS. Have you had that conversation with President Trump or with other officials in this administration? N not yet. Would you not yet. plan to? Do you think you will? Uh, I, I think so. I think that would be appropriate to have that circumstance, especially depending, I mean, history shows, we've done that before, right? And so if the history shows that that the, uh, it's taken, you know, a, a lengthy time to, to get the Bahamas back to where these people can can return to, I'm sure that that will be discussion we'll be having. Thank you, Commissioner Morgan. So, uh, just following up on the uh, dangerous condition point, um, there are increasing reports of extortion and also kidnappings of MPP returnees. Is your agency tracking this trend, and are you doing anything to lessen the risk of migrants? And then a follow up to that. So, you're talking about uh, uh, in those that are waiting in Mexico under MPP. Turning to Mexico, uh, yes. Yeah. So, so let me address that, and, and I think that's important. So, um, I, I, I've read the same reports. I've heard the same anecdotal uh, allegations. Uh, to this date, uh, Mexico has provided uh, nothing to the, the United States. Um, corroborating or verifying those allegations. But here's what I would say, is the mere fact that those allegations are here, this should really drive us to want to have intellectually honest conversations about the core drivers of this crisis. What is at the core driving this crisis? And we know that, but we're not talking about it enough. The cartels, they start exploiting and abusing the, the, these vulnerable, this vulnerable population before they leave their home country. They're selling them a bill of goods. They're promising, hey, you mortgage your home. You, 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 you give us thousands of dollars, and we're going to take you on this dangerous trek through, through multiple countries because we're going to promise you, because of America's broken laws, you're going to be allowed into this country. The cartels are exploiting them from day one, taking their money. We've, we've heard from independent sources that on this dangerous track, up to 33 percent are abused, 33 percent. And once they get in, into the United States, that exploitation doesn't start. They have to continue to, to uh, um, extort them to pay off the bill for taking them through, whether it's sex slavery, whatever that is. So the exploitation, it continues from day one. That's the core issue. That's what we want to stop. And MPP is doing just that. MPP, let me finish this. This is important. MPP, one of the most significant things that MPP is doing is they're telling the cartels and this vulnerable population the game has changed. If you come here, even with a kid, it used to be you come here with a kid, that was your passport in the United States, MPP is saying that's done. That's a lie now. You can't. You're not going to be allowed into this country even if you bring a kid. So don't mortgage your home. Don't pay the cartels. Don't risk your life. Don't risk the life of your family. When you get in here, don't allow yourself to continue to get exploited. That's what MPP is doing. Confirm that the Morgan. MPP court proceedings yes, is Commissioner on Morgan, schedule. I'll, I'll, Commissioner Morgan, Morgan, let me um, ask you about the Office of Special Counsel recently found CBP in violation of DNA collection laws for individuals 
in their custody, in your custody, when we start complying with these DNA collection laws? So re remember, and I, I, so I'm, I'm glad you asked this, this question, So, because I, I want to clear one of the false narratives out there that, that DHS, because this really is a DHS issue, has violated some law by, by not doing this, and that's just factually inaccurate, is that uh, previously the, the no, no, let me finish. Uh, I'll explain why we're not violating the law. Because under the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, the, the Attorney General, I, I'm answering your question, if you'll if you allow me to, right? So the Attorney General has has stipulated that there's a waiver. So and he's he's allowed the Secretary of DHS to decide whether they want to apply that waiver. And this was done under former Secretary Napolitano for a whole host of what I think are legitimate operational concerns and budgetary issues of why they granted that waiver. So now, so I just want to make sure there's there's no violation of law. Let's fast forward to today. I believe uh, personally that we need to take a look at this and we need to, to figure out a, a meaningful and thoughtful way of where we can begin to uh, look at where it's appropriate to start applying at, with, with, with CODIS. And we are currently under discussions with DHS and the Department of Justice to come up with a, a meaningful, thoughtful strategy to begin that. So what, what is so, the, the time sir. frame? What is the time frame for you complying with it then? Yes, what's sir. the time frame for complying uh, with it, Mr. Yes, sir. Mr. Commissioner? What's the time frame for yes, sir. complying? Go ahead. Why can't you I'll just answer that simple question? Uh, what's the time so, frame for complying with it? So we, I, I don't have a time frame because we need to make sure we we need we need. It'd be nice if you let me actually answer your question without you interrupting well, you me. So so I'm trying to answer a question right now. Okay. Thank you. So so. We don't have a time because there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, it's not it's not just as simple as one day we say, okay, start sending out the kits and do it. It's not that simple. It's very complicated, and this is a DHS issue and the force, you know, and the continuum of the immigration process. There's multiple agencies that are involved. We need to figure out where in that continuum it would be the most appropriate. We could talk about budgetary issues. We got to talk about the impact to, to, to operations. We have to coordinate with the unions with respect to that. It's very complicated, and I answer your question question is that we're going to do this in a very meaningful, thoughtful way, and when we're ready to actually execute it effectively, then that's when we'll do it. Yes, sir. Uh, Senators Marco Rubio and Rick Scott have recently said that um, the policy uh, with respect to the Bahamas is confusing. I'm not entirely sure with respect to what you've said so far is going to clarify that confusion. If you're a Bahamian, you're trying to enter the country, you're trying to evacuate, what is the visa requirement? So You, you mentioned that there are fees that are going to be waived? Can you be specific? Yeah, so I, I thought I'd address that. So this is a humanitarian mission, right, with respect to this. So if, if your life is in jeopardy, you're in the Bahamas, and, and you, you want to get to the United States, you're going to be allowed to come to the United States, right, whether you have travel documents or not. We've already allowed U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens. We've already processed people that have travel documents and don't have travel documents. And we're trying to do that in the most expeditious way we can to support the humanitarian mission. But again, as I stated before, we're still going to go through the process. And if you looked at the time that it processed, I think the first ship that came in had over 1,400 individuals. We did that ship in a couple hours, right? It was just amazing work that the folks at CBP did. But we're still going to do our job. We still need to process you. We still need to vet them to make sure that we're not letting dangerous people in, taking advantage of this. And I'll give you another example is we've had uh, uh, some individuals that brought um, children with them from the Bahamas who lost their mom and dad. So we need to make sure that that were they was there any nefarious activity involved or were they just doing it out of humanitarian reasons to pick the kid? And so far, that's what we've seen. But we still have to vet that out. So yes, ma'am, in the back. Thank you, Commissioner Morgan. You're touting the successes of the administration's policy changes, regulation, but also the help from Mexico. Yet you also said you expect numbers to go up next year if Congress doesn't act. Do you expect Mexico's support to wane in 2020 or is people to find work around to the new policies and rules? Why do you expect it to go up since you've seen so much success in the last few months? So that's a great question. So I, I am skeptical. Um, again, make no mistake, Mexico has stepped up an unprecedented way to be partners and really see this as a regional crisis. But as I said, we need them to do more. And there's specific targeted areas that we're going to we continue to talk to them that they need to do more. I am concerned whether the government of Mexico, including our partners in the Northern Triangle countries, are going to be able to sustain the level of, of commitment they have. But, but in addition to that, as a country, 
we cannot rely on other countries, no matter how great their support is, to fix our laws. If you think about it, it, it just can't be sustainable. So that's why I stick to that, that we need Congress to act. They know what to do, and they've failed the American people by not doing so. Commissioner. Yes, sir. Yeah, so just to clarify, you said you're going to vet the Bahamians coming in. Anyone who's deemed a threat, are they going to just be dropped back off in the Bahamas and left to fend for themselves? What's going to happen with that? No, of course not. And, and that's why I go with our normal procedure. So when we see somebody, normally, even outside the humanitarian process, we will uh, bring them in. Again, we have that immigration continuum with multiple agencies involved. They can come in. They can, you know, they can claim fear. They can do the normal process. Everything will be available to them. If we have someone that we we deem is inadmissible uh, that that came from the Bahamas. Obviously, we're not going to return them because it's unsafe. But for us, CBP, we will turn them over to uh, ICE ERO, who will take them and then detain them appropriately and continue out with the procedure. So, okay, one, one more question. Tell them in the back. Thank you. Uh, you just mentioned the agreement you this, this administration reached with the government of Guatemala. The president-elect of Guatemala, Alejandro Giamate, was here last week questioning this agreement and saying that he hasn't seen the documents yet. Um, uh, that's one question. What do you think about this agreement? Is it actually a function, like a functional agreement? And also, what other countries in Central uh, uh, are you talking to? Are you having talks? to reach agreement? So good question. So uh, I'm glad you asked that uh, uh, for a, a moment of clarification. So we, we we have the agreement ready to go, but it has not been ratified by the government of Guatemala. So you're correct on that. Now, we, we, we hope it will be, because uh, I think it will be significant. And then we're continuing to talk to not only the Northern Triangle countries, you know, obviously Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, but, but also Panama, uh, you know, any country that, that really can step up and is really a, a part of this immigration crisis that really is a regional issue. So, thank you. Alden, can you brief on the president's week this week, HBCUs and going to Baltimore? Can you come up to the podium, Hogan, please? You want me to come see you? Okay, I will. Hey, Hogan. <laughs> <laughs>